welcome to this podcast. Uh, we uh, we're going to spend a little bit less than an hour talking about engineering culture. And um, so, uh, before I start, I'm just gonna welcome uh, my two guests first and, and explain a little bit um, how this entire setup will go. Uh, we have we're going to have a few questions coming from uh, from the community here. Wow, that's a lot of people in the room, really. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, if you're new here, don't forget to say hi. Um, my name is Devi, and I work at Hikages. I'm the founder at Hikages, and I have two amazing guests here from uh, Bold.com. So oh, I can see people saying hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Mar uh, Mario. <laughs> okay, that's a lot of people. Uh, fantastic. So. Um, uh, I have two guests here, two Peters. One is Peter Paul, and the other one is Peter. And uh, I got to meet them a few months ago already. We had I had a chance to to talk with them uh, on on their podcast that I'm going to mention um, uh, uh, toward the end of this uh, session. And these two amazing Peter actually work for a little startup in Belgium and the Netherlands called Bold.com. Okay, I'm kidding. You know that Bold.com thing. They work there and um today uh i'm go i have the chance to sit with them and actually discuss engineering culture how to build it and how they build it they're building it at bold.com what are the challenges so if you guys have questions uh you people listening there feel free to jump in and and just write those questions and the questions uh, tab of, of this uh, platform, and we're gonna bring them up here, okay? Uh, so uh, uh, I'm going to start to just, I'm gonna dive a little bit into the, my, my uh, uh, guest. Uh, the first one is Peter Paul. Uh, Peter Paul works at Bold.com as an engineering manager. And uh, one of the things he, he, he says on his profile is building a great place for engineers. And I thought that might be a good way to start, but uh, give it a few seconds because I need to introduce another Peter, which is Peter Browers. And Peter Browers has been also at Ball.com for more than eight years. Actually, something that I'm curious to know, the two of you and so many of your colleagues that are on the engineering part, you have a lot of experience at Ball. So that's one of my questions later. So both work at Bold.com and they've been there for, uh, for years. And for anyone new here and who doesn't know Bold.com first, you, have, you, you probably haven't discovered the pandemic or you don't know what that thing is because everyone, even if you didn't know Bold.com by now, with the pandemic, you should have known that. They just deliver the stuff by, you order today and tomorrow it's at your place. So Bold.com is a retail tech platform mostly in the Netherlands and Belgium, and it offers quite some like uh, diverse uh, product that you can buy, buy on their platform. And without any plug, you get delivered tomorrow. If you, if you order, I think by the end of the day, you should have it delivered at your place tomorrow. So um, the topic of this podcast, as I mentioned, is the engineering culture, how to build it and how they deal with that at bold.com. So let's start with the first question here. Um, who are you? Peter, Peter, we want to start. Just give us in a, in a nutshell the things that I didn't mention here that will define you better. Peter yeah. Browers, we, yes. we start. Uh, thanks, yeah. yeah I'm going to say Peter for you and then Peter Paul for Peter Paul, OK? Great. Let's do this. <laughs> OK. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. Uh, really, uh, really great to hear. Uh, and uh, yeah. It was great to have you uh, in in our podcast. So great to uh, to be back in in yours, and um, yeah. So I'm I'm Peter Browers, an engineering manager in Bold.com since uh, well 2015. Uh, became the engineering manager. Before that, I had some other roles. Um, back then, more in the traditional organization, uh, IT development, IT operations. I was at the IT operations area, and now I'm more in the innovation area. Since the beginning of this year, working closely together with the development teams in the logistics area. And yeah, I like the tension in Bold.com between doing this innovation. Uh, on the one hand, we do that with over 100 Scrum teams. And on the other hand, yeah, we, we do that for 11 million customers, 40,000 sellers on the, on the, on the platform, uh, operating huge warehouses. So making that combination work is what I 
what I live for uh, in, in Bullet.com. So that's uh, that's me in a nutshell. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Uh, uh, Peter Paul. Yes. So um, yeah, before I was an engineer manager at Bullet.com, I was an architect uh, over there, and even before that, as a software engineer. And I think that gave me a real great insight in uh, like a lot of roles uh, that we have uh, in tech uh, at Bull.com and also enables me to uh, yeah, have a broad view on how yeah, we can actually build a great place to engineer and do this engineering and what, how we can lead in tech as, as Bull.com and also um, yeah, make being a retail tech platform really being a tech platform and because yeah there's so much IT and other tech underneath the platform for a lot of people to look like hey it's just a website how hard can it be but if you connect that to 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 the number of uh, of packages we have to deliver to to search how we can help you uh, there if you um, uh, forecasting uh, the, the demand all these different things have uh, algorithms and tech in there and it's it's awesome uh, to see all the things that we're doing there. And uh, adding a little to that, and one of the great things about being a podcast host, and I think that will also help, uh, hold for you, is that we get to talk to all these people doing all these great things that we otherwise wouldn't have to uh, be in contact with and never knew that we're actually doing some of yeah. this great stuff, stuff there. And that that yeah really makes me enthusiastic about uh, yeah sharing that and also sharing it here uh, with you today. Fantastic. So that leads me to one of my questions, which is, what is the engineering culture at Ball.com? How would you define that? Yeah. So first of all, one of the things that we can do with, with, with our engineering uh, culture is built on the Ball.com culture. So as a company, we already have uh, a culture. And I think that um, in some ways, you can't call us a startup anymore. I mean, we've been around for over 20 years. But a part of that vibe, a, a part of uh, uh, wanting to move on, uh, staying innovative, uh, going forward, solving the new problems, moving forward, I, I think that that really is, is, is part of our culture and, and uh, really wanting to achieve things over there, both in tech, commercial uh, operation sites everywhere. And I think that that's a part. Um, and that with, I think there's always room for, for, the, for the people. So we, we, within our, all our ambition, we never lose sight of the people. So we know that, I don't know, there has to be room for uh, people to grow, to evolve themselves, to, to learn new things, uh, to explore new opportunities, either in, in a new team or in the same team, basically everywhere in, in Bull.com. And I think that yeah, we offer quite some possibilities uh, there. And for us as, as engineer managers, it's mostly enabling the people to see these opportunities and feel that they really can contribute uh, there and explore for themselves. Okay. Well, what will be your take, Peter? Yeah, and I, to, to add to, to uh, what Peter Paul says, the, the being this startup or not, I think it was a year ago I said, uh, that I had a job interview with uh, with a with an engineer, potential engineer, and uh, he shared with me the the, the story. And I asked him the question, okay, why do we want to work with Bull.com? Yeah. And he explained, yeah, I, I'm now within a smaller company, and now I want to work with a corporate. And I realized, okay, we became that big, but I still had the feeling we are well startup scale up. We have this entrepreneurship thing in our in our genes. So that that's. What we what we all feel and uh, that, so that, I was really fantastic. So, so that, let, let me let me just go back a few years ago because you, you you both joined more than eight years ago. It means that you also experienced that fast growth. So um, uh, uh, based on your background, I can see Peter Paul, for example, you were on a, a, a IT architecture and things like that. So so many other things happened in the last decade that you had to deal with on a daily basis. Um, how did you manage to keep engineers involved on the day-to-day -to, -day to still deliver a product for millions of people to use? 
And how does that engineering culture that you say it's part of the ball.com culture help make it happen? Like, can you take me an example, like a precise example of the challenges indeed that you, you, you had and how you solved them in, in these years? Right. Well, I, I think it's great to, to look, uh, look back in that way. But when I joined ball.com, I came from, let's say, a consulting uh, background. And uh, okay. of course, one of the, the things that, that I was thinking about when how can this be challenging to me for a long time? Yeah, how can because uh, I was used to to go from a certain Simon to the, to the next to the next and yeah. uh, so um, but within the first year and back then I was still working as a as a software engineer I've discovered uh, more new technologies that I was able to work with than in the three years before so I thought hey I'm onto something <laughs> here because it, it, yeah this this will certainly not be boring and the other thing is. Uh, without um, so with 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 our uh, our growth and our scaling, uh, that means that that every uh, that, so a problem that isn't that big in, in year one can be big in three years, and you don't have to fix it in year one, but in year three, okay, now this is becoming big and it's affecting too many um, uh, customers or too many partners, and now we really have to solve it. And then you have to, I don't know, come up with new functionality to, to really help them out. Or maybe the data volume in your service has uh, doubled and you need to figure out a way how to deal, uh, how to deal with that. And sometimes, um, basically because uh, yeah, we're coming from monoliths to services to microservices, then if, if the, let's say, if, if the traffic would just double because of let's say the double amount of orders, but because you're also moving to smaller components, it's way faster. It's uh, yeah. so the, the volume to your services is, is, it grows way faster and you have to accommodate for that. So there you have a technical problem to solve, not just a big business problem, but a scalability problem. And yeah. Maybe you need new technology for, for that. Uh, and that's, I think that both uh, every two, three years, there are new business things that you have to, to tackle and to solve and new technology problems. And moving uh, to both of these, I think that that is challenging to a lot of software engineers, and that also is challenging for me, both as as an architect formerly and now as an engineer manager, to how how to help these people support these teams to be able to accommodate for that. And I, I think that um, yeah, that that's one of the things that keep it challenging, and you always. Let's say you would reflect every year on, okay, I'm still at the right place. And then you will check, yeah, are there still challenges ahead for me? And yeah, there's never been a year for me that there was a, no, 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 it's actually, it started to become boring. There, there are no challenges for me here anymore. So I think that answers your question, right? Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I, I will, I, I'm going to come back on it more on the, uh, the specifics, meaning that um, uh, it, it, I, I, I just, tackle the challenges you face more on like, oh, there's this technology that came up or there is this competitor that came up or something happened on the market and you had to accelerate or decelerate. How do you handle that? But that's on the scalability of the engineering team. But I, I, I come back to it uh, later. Something that I'm interested in, I, I want to stay in the engineering culture globally at ball.com. Um, the uh, if you if you think I'm gonna take an example that is a bit uh, far right there, but that would probably make sense to everyone here. If I, I tell you Facebook as a company, okay, a lot of people they see the Facebook.com. What I see at Facebook, I see the engineering part. I, I don't use Facebook. I just I just log in on engineering.facebook.com. If you don't know that website, it's a, it's a gold mine for engineers to learn stuff because their engineers publish things there all the time. One of the things they say there is uh, break things, move fast. That it's part of their engineering culture. It's part of the thing, yeah. like when they hire an engineer, they want them to be able to take those initiatives, deliver on, the, on something that can bring value to the company and then, and then move on to the next thing and be able to roll back if what you did isn't working, just roll it back. And that's because they have a, a system that can sustain that. So my question for you are, do you have something like that at Bull? 
that that def that will define that engineering culture like uh, i'm looking for that little nuts there uh, basically is there yeah, something even if, there? if you have the, the the situation like in facebook fail fast is is also one of our uh, principles in many areas okay. and uh, it, but it should be possible right if you think of a warehouse and you want to experiment with something uh, and you you break the process over there and and, and the, the the whole process stops in the warehouse then you have an issue but if you have it in in the web shop with a specific block in your in your shop then you can experiment and and do a b testing and that kind of stuff and you can you can do um, really great work over there so it depends a bit on the on the area you're in but if you look at our culture i i believe one of our main items to discuss is autonomy we we really believe okay. that teams the, the development team should be autonomous as possible so meaning that they can decide together with with the business what to work on and um and how to how to build that and uh also working closely together with with our platform team and delivering that to production themselves so if if that is is the case then they can go as a team as fast as possible and, and how, the... how are these teams structured in a way so to, to make them to give that, that that them that autonomy how do are they then structure um yeah. generally so uh, it's a structure of um, um and last year we we went over to the product organization and that means that means that we have a, a a team of um yeah business and and it people together in the team so business analysts product owner software engineers scrum masters and they are together responsible for a product within the whole landscape of Bolletcom within all and within our domain setup we have we have defined eight domains and within then within the domains we defined uh, the the products so as a team you're responsible for one product and and you work on that product and within that product you you want to add the value for the customer or for the seller uh, you're working for and that's and that's what we believe in and and what we uh, put our money on five years ago when we said okay we want to get rid of the monoliths we want to go to the moon we want to make a huge step and we we call the project man on the moon but we had those ideas but we couldn't get uh, get a lift off we we tried to initiate that with with project managers with uh, with management so after the third attempt we said okay what what do we need to do what do we want to achieve we want autonomy so we we need the teams to ask themselves what do you want to achieve so and when okay. when we started that with the teams themselves then they, the team started to find to define what they want, and then we got traction. The team started to work on uh, on the, this autonomy themselves, and you had front runners in that uh, man on the moon uh, um, project. And uh, soon, the first teams delivered their own software to production. So that that was for me the proof of autonomy is is key for the results in Bold.com for innovation. So, Interesting. Uh, yeah. I, I, I'm just going to add up on this part. Uh, then, uh, how do you maintain the fact that okay, it's it's a it's a big organization that moves fast, but then each teams having their own autonomy can end up being a startup within a, a big organization, right? So, how can you maintain? How, how do you uh, uh, the, the, the the culture make sure that as people are uh, 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 teams are building. Uh, features and move them up it still fits the organization goal the whole overall organization goal uh, do you have like a, a kpis or a, a okrs or these kind of things uh, metrics that you use to maintain Thanks, that yeah sure so first of all actually we don't want teams to build features because what we want is that the business or someone with a problem comes to them and they create a solution for that instead of them delivering um, features to people requesting features so there's more um, a conversation going on than someone telling i want this which is delivering a feature at least to me in my language um, and then the part so with, with the domain so uh, in the product organization we also move to uh, first, we tried out OGSM. Now we move to OKRs. Basically, but what we have, we have like uh, I think there are five or six, uh, depending on the year, uh, like uh, directions uh, given by our, our our board. And within that, every product and domain of products has to decide. From, okay, then if these are the most important things for Bold.com, then that means for our domain, 
or our product, that these are the most important things for us. Um, so, uh, for example, if uh, having uh, more, um, I don't know, um, uh, traffic that's not coming from Google because part of the traffic coming from Google, we have to pay for it because it's uh, based on, uh, on, on advertisements. Right. Yeah. Then we have to build a better search engine so people can actually find on our platform um, uh, what they are looking for. So, so and, and, no, and then you can come up with, with several purposes that you want to work on. Yeah. Then, in, then the teams uh, who are working on the, on the search engine, and the, they have to come up with their goals and their steps that they want to achieve to, to, to get to that mission. And so it, it kind of cascades down. Um, but the questions, can we make this better, go down? And the solutions are, are going up, basically, because we don't want people to say, okay, we need a button there that does that. No, we want, okay, we want to achieve this. How can we do that? And then uh, the minds of these engineers, which are in general real great at coming up with creative, constructive solutions, yep. are triggered and we're moving forward. Okay. Fantastic. That uh, yeah, that that answer really my question there. The um, actually there are so many other questions coming from the the audience. So thank you everyone. It's like uh, uh, have more like a lot of people in the room. So if you have more questions, please ask them there. I will make sure that I bring them up. Uh, some of you have already asked questions, and I it, they kind of mirror already some of the, some of the questions I have here. Uh, so. I'm gonna take another uh, 10 minutes asking question and then bring your question on, 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 on the stage and uh, uh, hopefully we get uh, uh, more answers there. Uh, there. There is something as, as a founder and uh, as a software engineer that I, 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 I struggle with. is the fact that when I was bringing engineering engineers together, there was this idea of a stack, meaning I don't want to work with Java. I want to work with .NET. I want to work with the latest shiny stuff. I want to try React. Oh, no, 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 we're going to use TypeScript. And then you're like, at some point, you need to make a decision. And some people will be happy. Other people will be disappointed. But they still need to work together, right? So I'm talking about the tech stack. And my question is more about like how the tech stack plays a role in your organization in general yeah yeah and i, I think that uh, indeed based on the tech stack you attract uh, a group of people right uh, and in bot.com uh, we are using uh, java kotlin a lot uh, but also teams started to use uh, go golan uh, in the past uh, teams uh, started to experiment with rust uh, Obviously, in the data science hook, you will see a lot of Python being used, and the same goes for the for the databases. We have some uh, some databases running in Oracle, but we we move to Postgres, and in the cloud, we we are moving to the cloud native uh, database uh, solutions. Okay, and the same goes for the um, uh, the the, the NoSQL solutions as well. So, so what you can see is a lot of open source um, uh, minded people uh, in there, and that that. That comes also with uh, with a specific culture, I believe. But how does it work in Bull.com if you think that um, going to use uh, TypeScript, for instance, if, if that's a good idea, uh, and you can convince the product owner and you make it maintainable in the longer run, um, then yeah, you you are okay to go. Uh, but but yeah, we uh, if you use it with more uh, more teams, then there will be a, a platform team that can support you in that. So that, that's a trade-off. Eh? If you want to do it all yourself, you have to operate it all yourself, then that will take time. If it if it's done by the platform, if you can use building blocks from the platform, then you you benefit from that and you do can do more innovation. So yeah, you, you should balance that that out as well. And we have some um yeah some new uh, roles like the tech lead role that can support the teams in making those decisions. Um, we 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 have uh, in our move to the cloud. We have discussions with with the platform. What do we support in the longer run, and and what not, and what not yet, and what what should be put on the roadmap. So um, there's a lot of angles to to look at it. But but basically, again, like I said before, autonomy is is uh, is really huge. But obviously within boundaries, because if you're starting to use .NET, 
yeah, then then you're doubling the the amount of maintenance on all the areas. So yeah, because it's not easy to run to run uh, on the same uh, same platform. So that that's something we want to avoid. Okay, so I I I I, I can see why the, why the tech the uh, the tech stack could be an issue there and. Uh, uh, I was I was running a workshop a few a few weeks ago, and I was explaining that group of people, mostly technical recruiter and salespeople, why a technical stack within a company is actually one of the the element a company can leverage to attract people. You, you don't call me if you have a, a, a cobalt job. Uh, I don't think no 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 one here in the call would be like, hey, I'm interested. I'm interested in your cobalt job. It, it could pay millions, but you still think, well, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I won't be playing with something that brings me value. Technically, it's, it will probably bring, bring me money right away, but not uh, 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 some technical value. So that's why that question was important for me. But it actually leads me to um, another problem uh, that most of company faces, and uh, I want to understand how you deal with that at Ball.com. You have the tech stack. And then you have uh, you uh, people are happy they have an amazing tech stack. And then at some point, someone comes with an idea. And and actually that question is great because Peter, you working on an innovation part, which means that sometimes you just have to run experiments. So you have engineers that would love to just run experiment, like write something, ship it, make it uh, make it available make it out there, yeah. and then other will be like, no, make sure that it's perfect. Like, and then you make it available. So how do you deal with that uh, uh, that dilemma? I call it a dilemma. For, uh, the dilemma is uh, ship it fast, experiment, or no, 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 no. Don't do it fast. Make it make sure that it's perfect and put it out there. How do you deal with that at ball.com? Yeah, so <laughs> and being being an agile company, what we what we want is is feedback really quickly and the feedback that we what that we need comes from the customer or the or the partners uh, and so so it's important to ship your um yeah your, mi your minimal viable product as soon as possible and and see what what the come out is uh, and uh, if check your uh, hypothesis if you if you put it on paper and then adapt to it uh, so if if you say okay it needs to be perfect first before we ship it it sounds like okay this take this is taking too too much time and and we have to wait too long for the feedback to come in so um be as quick as possible uh, but but of course in some areas in a safe way that okay and do you, do you guys do you guys keep uh, like uh, uh, in your metrics do you have like a number of experiments that you you've you've done, and then is that something a metric that that is important at at uh, at ball.com? I know, for example, at a company like AWS, they, um, they they keep track on how many experiments they've tried, so they can check how fast their system can adapt to to, uh, to these fast-paced uh, uh, um, companies. Do you have such a thing? But Paul, would you know? I, I know we have the experiment team, but uh, do they? And I do know we do a lot of experimentation, uh, especially in, in the web shop, a lot of A-B uh, testing, just like, for example, okay. companies like Booking.com uh, do, because they're uh, one of the most important things, of course, in the web shop is conversion. And we're really trying to influence that, uh, that part. There. So there, there, the number of experiments indeed is, is really, really important. Uh, but on the other hand, for a lot of other teams, for example, um, I don't know, we're doing a stock valuation or stock keeping or, or purchasing, and then the number of experiments is, is less relevant there. Now, for uh, uh, to finance, of course, uh, accuracy is way more important uh, than, uh, than the number of experiments because uh, they do not value experiments, they value accuracy. Um, and they especially like it at one point in time, and that's when uh, when the uh, the booking period uh, ends. So basically, before to the day before the booking period ends, you can experiment whatever you want. But on the other day, there has to be accuracy and uptime. Whereas it, so uh, it really depends on on what what your customer is looking for. With a purchasing team, are they really trying to experiment? 
smart ways to, to purchase goods. So that's a team where they, in, even in their uh, user interface, here every now and then they are saying, okay, we're going to create this for you. And then uh, on a Wednesday afternoon, okay, we'll put it live and then, then people are using it internally. And they say, ah, this is rubbish. This is not working. And then the engineers go, uh, going over the code, uh, creating new stuff. And then on a Thursday afternoon, there will be something new. And then they have like an 80% version and then we'll, they will be fact, perfecting it and gradually uh, improving on it. And there we are really in the stage where, where yeah, creating value and checking whether the value is there is still more important than the number of experiments, but it's yeah. working together and offering this value and, and seeing are we moving in the, in the right direction. And that's really what we're trying to, to explore there together with uh, the, the users that work with the operational system uh, there. Okay, fantastic. Listen, we have uh, another uh, 20 minutes here. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually take questions from the audience. Uh, so far, so good. Uh, uh, so I have, actually we have a lot of questions that came from the audience. So uh, <laughs> I keep, keep, keep sending them and I will uh, take some of them and bring that on stage. Uh, I'm going to start with a question from uh, uh, Force Etema, uh, if, I, if I pronounce that really well. Uh, she's asking or is asking uh, uh, what kind of activities or processes uh, do you have to maintain your engineering culture? Yeah, so, just, so first of all, um, yeah, as, as a group of engineering managers, we have to be constantly uh, uh, looking for opportunities to, to stimulate that. And uh, in a way, uh, culture comes from um, yeah, the questions you ask and the answers you provide to certain questions and repeating that and repeating that. So we have to do get these basics right, uh, uh, actually. And besides that, we have to um, yeah, undertake activities that really strengthen the community. Yeah? So um, yeah, we have a lot of internal uh, talks where engineers from within ball.com give a talk to uh, to all the others to whoever wants to join basically uh, we have a yearly uh, uh, what you call the spaces summit so uh, basically uh, um, a, a day where there are lots of activities like that uh, lo lots of talks uh, basically our our internal uh, uh, yeah summit actually a lot of external speakers also, meetups, yeah, when we could do meetups uh, at least. Yep. And of course the pod uh, podcast. And there we, yeah, we try to uh, really keep the, the, the spirit of uh, 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 yeah, enterprising and, and trying out new things, discovering new things and sharing this knowledge uh, for, with all the engineers. Um, we try, we try, really trying to keep that alive. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I remember Hackages uh, in 2019 or 18. We had uh, uh, yeah the chance to run a workshop, uh, uh, a workshop with um, uh, a meetup with Ball.com in uh, in uh, Utrecht. Uh, I, I remember. So yeah, fantastic. I'm, I'm going to take uh, another question here. Uh, actually, people are voting the question. So there is a question that has 11 votes, which is a lot, uh, and. I think we might have answered that, but I'm going to put it, bring it back on the floor. Uh, so how do you balance feature delivery versus uh, tech debt, right? That, that's, uh, so the idea is like, how do you keep the factory floor tidy and, and functioning while still delivering value? Yeah, that's a good question and uh, very relevant. Uh, we see that every day, uh, the, the tech debt, if you uh, if you want to go fast, sometimes you take the shortcut and in the end, it, you will end up with some tech debt. And um, I, I know from the past uh, that that we actually had some time, which we called IT time on, on the roadmaps, in which you could use to, uh, to, to uh, attack this uh, tech debt. Um, but later on, we said, yeah, tech debt is also part of, of your your uh, product. Eh? So it should be part of the, um, yeah, the ownership of the product owner as well to, to, to solve that. So you should be in discussion with, with, with the product owner as a team to say and to address this tech debt and say, OK, this is now maybe not blocking us, but in the long run, it will. So we need to solve it. And the best way to do it is when you touch the code for uh, for some functionality, so that that's always a good approach to um, to do it like that. 
And if not, um, but you see it's it's becoming a bigger and bigger problem, yeah, then it needs to be uh, addressed as a as an innovation topic as well. So uh, yeah, reliability reliability is also one of your key functionalities, and and TechNet may, might be uh, blocking that as well. So yeah, try to solve it, and also yeah, if it's blocking your innovation, to start to solve it. So that's how we uh, how we. Continu continuously address it together with uh, with the engineers, with with the product owner, with the, with the with the business people to um, to make a point of it and to improve. Uh, I like to, to to add a little to it because yeah. it it. Uh, but you also see that that some of the the things for tech depth you can see coming. For example, when our platform teams are deprecating some of our internal tools, then they uh, announce that I don't know a year or two years. Uh, Upfront, something uh, depending on, on, on what they're deprecating. And for me, as an engineering manager, what I try to check with the product owner then is: Can we do this as early as possible? Because then we have the freedom to actually do this at a time that suits us. And if we wait yeah. for the deadline, then at some point in time, we have no freedom to choose more. Uh, yeah. We have no freedom to choose left. And then it becomes a burden. So what you you always want to to uh, to tackle the problem at at the point where you still have a a decision to make, where you're still in control of the decision, and you should try to avoid um, uh, yeah becoming uh, that someone else makes a decision for you and, and you're out of control. So that's why, just like the the tough problems in in in, in agile approach, they should be as early as possible. Yeah, the same goes for this and. Um, the other thing that we really try to do is to get uh, as much operational work from from uh, a team from the software engineers in the team. So uh, at, at some point in time, some of our teams were really bothered with a lot of questions uh, like, where's my order? Can you query the database to check where this is? What's the status of whatever? Now, with two years ago, something like that, we moved, we made a real big step in uh, making all our big data uh, available to basically all our users. And from that point on, we started building dashboards for the business users to check these things. And then you could move a lot of load, uh, which wasn't actually work by developers or software engineers become software engineers, just querying a database. That would be a part of, the, of a user's job. So we're moving, trying to move that away, but then again, also gives them room to, I don't know, try out new technology, uh, keep the um, keep the things up to date and, and keep it running. And another angle from which we approach this, and it's maybe partially in the question, is from security standpoint. Okay. For us as a web shop, it's really important to, uh, especially the, the the libraries that we're using that aren't uh, up to date security wise, keep updating. So we have uh, a dashboard in place. But basically, uh, every team can see there are the are the services that I'm. Uh, responsible for, are they up to date or are there things lacking uh, there? Should we move to a new version, things like that? So we also provide tools to check, uh, for the teams to check uh, how good are we on the, on the in our tech health. And uh, because you have the tools available, they make it visible. And if it's visible, it's easier to do a, a follow up. And, and that's also how we try to provide these tools to the teams. Fantastic. I, I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna. I, there's still more questions actually coming in from from the people there. So let me take another one. Uh, so there is a question about engagement. So uh, how do you keep engineer engaged during the pandemic when working remote? Because usually people were all uh, converging toward the office more than a year ago, and that's 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 a long time ago. And now they're all remote. So how do you keep them engaged? Uh, 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 with this new setup? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And um, and engagement is, is, is really important. So it starts with, uh, in, in the, indeed, with uh, in onboarding and new people. We hire new people a lot. So we had to uh, translate our onboarding process into a, a virtual one. Uh, so people who are new at Bold.com pick up the laptops themselves at the office and then they go home. Uh, and uh, and onboarding starts with uh, 
uh, presentations by the by our board members with presentations about IT uh, with uh, team lunches with with their own team they start in and uh, and start talking about well, what the team is about to get to know the team members. So you yeah you we try we yeah we move this onboarding process step by step into a, a virtual onboarding. Um, so that's how to how to onboard people and yeah as an engineering manager I'm I'm trying to stay in touch uh, in the beginning uh, a lot to, to to see how things go in the team with uh, with the new people uh, what what we expect in this first phase I, uh, what I see a lot with with uh, when engineers start in the team um, they want to um, maybe already on the first day they say okay and when I'm what what's the moment I'm starting to code? And then I said, yeah, well, you can start coding, but in this time, in this in this beginning of period, it's very important to take your time to get to know the organization, the people, to understand the landscape, and and take your time for that. And th this adding value will follow uh, for sure, and uh, be aware of that. So uh, I have a th th there is a, a, a one thing we do at Hackages, but uh, I I I think I copy that from a, a different. I don't remember which company was doing it first, but this idea, like when you onboard new people, you want them to make a pull request the first day. So that's why, so it becomes your metric to the point where you build your organization in a way like when someone arrives, you don't spend one week to configure the computer and things like that. It has to be done that day. They push the code that day. In, like not just pushing the code, but make it available in production. So that gives that satisfaction to engineers like, okay, I'm here to contribute. Let's make it happen. But, yeah, so uh, th th that's okay. And then many times that happens in the first week eh, that they even do it yeah. in production. But yeah. I, I, I want to say it's um, d don't feel the, the the pressure to to add that value in, in, in uh, for 40 hours a week already from the first day on. Take, the, take your time to, to learn uh, also, the, the the outside boundaries of the team, so uh, to get to know the organization. So that's that's important in onboarding phase as well. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of engagement, what 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 is really important is to constantly understand what you are working on for for the for the company. So um, I have in mind always the story of the former uh, CEO of Bol.com, and he said to me once, "Okay, if you are not able to explain anymore." What your contribution is for the for the customer or for the sellers then we should have a talk come by and we should have a talk because you should be able to explain and that's what we what we also also trying to do with with the teams try to explain okay how does it add to to bullet.com how how does it become a better platform and, and make it easier for our customers to shop and uh, so raising those questions make them part of that story that's that's really important for engagement as well and yeah, next to that we have uh, um, yeah, we, the stand-ups. We extended the stand-up with with some social talks uh, in in Corona times. So you take your time to yeah. to understand how people are doing behind their screens. Um, and I also do that within the within the bilas I have with with uh, with uh, with the people and the teams. Um, so yeah, and like Peter Paul already shared, we maintain our culture is also part of yeah engage the people in in inspire them with other stories and what 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 other department uh, departments are doing so uh, taking time for that is is really great last week we had bot.com wide the inspiration day we call it and for that they created uh, yeah this this digital platform where you sh where you can go into different location locations and uh, check a check a presentation or check an interview uh, would really like a, a physical uh, summit so yeah, really great to see that engagement uh, as well, and yeah, people are talking about it. So, uh, how, yeah. how many engineer are we talking about here at at Paul .com? It's uh, yeah. right now with the IT organization is around 700, 700 people, and in total, I think we are somewhere between uh, two thousand two hundred, maybe yeah. even more. So, uh, that, that, yeah. that, that's huge. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to take another uh, a few questions here. Uh, we, we still have about 10, 15 minutes. Uh, there's Alberto asking, uh, what would you like to hear during a job interview to say, like, to be like, wow, this person matches our <laughs> our culture, our business culture. So you want to bring that person on board. What, what is, is there such a thing? 
because a lot of people in this room that be like they, they call you tomorrow and they will just make sure that that happens so <laughs> that that happen. <laughs> but Paul, you want to start yeah i'm not sure whether whether there's there's one thing but there's uh, there's a few things that that at least i will be looking for uh, in the interview i think we we want to see whether you really understand agile so that that so anything in your answers that uh, smells like hierarchy and that you love hierarchy or want to solve problems in a hierarchic way it will basically disqualify you uh, so the other way around is qualifying you the other thing that i will typically be uh, looking for is initiative that you take to improve the tech stuff so taking the initiative to come up with a new framework, uh, to speed up things in the build pipeline, to come up with a better way to, to test the code, to, to come up with things like that. Take the initiative, and even if it doesn't go fluent, have the persistence to get it done and to get your, you and your team there or even the whole of Bold.com there. An example of that. And another example in, in uh, improving the way of working really helps. So if if uh, the team isn't running smooth and you should, uh, I don't know, uh, improve the feedback that, that you're giving to, improve the way of working around the, the merge requests uh, that you're doing, improving the intake or the discussions about uh, the user story, something like that, show that you Im Im improve that. Uh, you should show, be able to show that you can handle feedback. So, uh, because, yeah, you need an open communication, so you need to be open to that open communication, and you need to be resilient. You need to be able to adapt to new situations. So, um, and I think that especially the latter really helped us in the beginning of the pandemic. And basically talking about culture, we had a culture shock because everything was different and the normal answers didn't work. So what we see is that we could really easily transition to that part because most of our engineers are uh, yeah, uh, selected in being resilient and being able to handle these changes and changes between teams, changes in priorities, uh, things like that. And I think that yeah, with, with these five, uh, that will uh, really help you. Uh, and you've got the code really well, actually. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, to, and to uh, add to uh, that. Would you like to add? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. The, I'm not sure if you already mentioned it, but uh, I, I think it's really important to have the the customer focus as well. And the customer can be the customer, and but also our partner or uh, the warehouse you're working for. It really depends. But you should be know what you're working on. So it's not just tell me what to do and I will do it. No, you have to be able to to explain what you're working on and even give some pushback to uh, towards the, um, the product owner requesting this, really asking questions, okay, and why are we doing this and why should this be the best uh, way uh, to do it and, what, and to, to, you know, to add the value and maybe think along and, and come up with even better solutions uh, for, the, for, the, for the customer. So that's also uh, something I'm, uh, I'm looking at, uh, customer focus, yeah. Fantastic. So um, I'm gonna go back quickly to, I, I, still, I, I still have, two questions that I'm going to pick from, from the audience. Uh, I'm sorry, people, I couldn't I couldn't pick all of them. We don't have much time, but we still have a lot. Um, but uh, two of them actually uh, are uh, focused on the autonomy. One of the points you mentioned is the autonomy at, at ball.com, right? And uh, the autonomy given to the team. Uh, the two questions mentioned something about uh, how do you balance autonomy and uh, a standardization or more like uh, autonomy as a concept? Yeah, it's it's great, but it it also comes with a lot of issues. It means that it can completely be detached to the organization because people become so aut autonomous that they lose the the connection with, with the organization. How do you handle that at, at, at uh, ball.com? I think that oh, if, Peter, if, actually, if, if, sorry. If the, the, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. Peter, Paul. Uh, uh, Peter already gave the uh, uh, the, the, the answer to, to the latter one. That's basically you have to be you have to know what you're working on. How the thing you are working on is helping either our uh, 
uh, our customers, uh, our partner, uh, partners, so the other sellers on our platform, or our internal organization. If you're not aware of that, then you get detached. But as long as you know what you're working on, why you're uh, uh, working on it, and what you're achieving for Bolded Commerce Company, there's very little risk that you get detached from it because you have something that's tying you to at least a part of the organization or its customers or, or, uh, or its partners. And then on the, on the technical side, so what we really, um, uh, they, so for our internal tools, they should be so at, attractive that actually nobody wants to use other tools. So that's, that's actually an enormous pressure on the people <laughs> building, building these, tools. Yeah. these internal tools because every time uh, a team decides not to use their tool, they have to be wondering, oh, how can this be? And then starts the conversation with them to improve their tool. And you actually see that happening for some of the tools internally now. But then the other part of, of, of the alignment thing is, okay, to what do you have to uh, align to? So, uh, for example, uh, we want you to be able, with the technology you, you choose, to deploy very often. So you have to be able to, to test it, uh, but also uh, you either have to use uh, a pipeline that's already there, or you have to build one yourself. Uh, we want you to see, you, you have to be responsible for uh, the, the performance and whether your application is working well. So you need alerting and monitoring uh, so, and because we want to be able to check that as a process and not just as a standalone service, yeah, you have to connect to our logging and metrics platform and our alerting platform. So as long as you can come up with a technology uh, that fulfills that and the security stuff of that, then there's actually one hurdle you have to take. And that's basically the knowledge that we're uh, developing to keep this running. Will that still be there in three or five years? So if I have uh, some very niche product that I'm the only one who knows, yeah, then of course it's a risk for the company. We can do that. But further on, uh, there are lots of things that you can go ahead with. And um, Peter earlier said, uh, yeah, the Microsoft thingy, that has always been an issue when we were running our own uh, data center. But if we are running in the cloud, if there's a good Thing that runs this Microsoft uh, 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 stuff, yeah. just go ahead because you just have to monitor it. And the APIs of our, our metrics and monitoring platform, they're all open, so you can connect to them. Yeah. Uh, make my day. Uh, let's uh, show us. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, people, I think we only have five minutes to go. And uh, and I can see that we can go on and on because there's so many other area of like engineering culture we can cover here. Unfortunately, we have to slowly uh, uh, close this, this podcast uh, uh, um, for today. However, I have two more questions. I had a few more, but I'm going to uh, narrow that down to two, two more questions. Uh, uh, the, the, the first one is the fact that you're both running a podcast. And uh, and the podcast it's basically a bold.com podcast, right? And I want just to understand how this helped you in your uh, uh, building that engineering culture, or does that even help? And what is the goal? Yeah, so a um, couple of years ago, we we started off with uh, with the techlab.bold.com and uh, with with publishing uh, some blog posts over there. So sharing knowledge is is something we believe in is is very important. Eh? We we gain a lot of knowledge within the company and sharing that with the community. It's like using the open source software. Eh? Sharing with with the community is really important to to learn from each other. So that's that's why we started the techlab.bol.com. Uh, and um, yeah, two years ago, uh, Peter Paul and I sat together and I said, yeah, well, I'm listening to podcasts a lot in the car. Back then, that was uh, still the case and. Uh, I realized, well, this could be an opportunity for us as well, because recording a podcast is is a low barrier way of uh, uh, yeah, producing content and, and sharing that knowledge. So uh, that's what we uh, we started with. And um, uh, it, it started off as an experiment just to find out, OK, how does it work? Where do we publish it? Uh, how does the marketing of, of podcasts go? So we had to find out everything ourselves. and. Uh, 
yeah, but we found out it was really fun to do. And like Peter Paul already explained, it's it's um, it's getting it's it's great to to learn all those stories from the the people inside, but also outside Bullet.com. Uh, we had a chat with you as well, so really great to learn from uh, from the, from the community and to share it with the community. So uh, that that's why we started it. And yeah, to be honest, I'm I'm not an engineer, but now I know what it feels to to click the button to publish the to push uh, the publish button and bring it on to production it, it gives uh, it gives real uh, great energy to uh, to bring something to production yeah yep fantastic so, uh, and and uh, my my last question is um uh, basically uh, we're starting that journey as well uh, in 2019 i actually started that journey of bringing amazing people like yourself on on my podcast but we stopped that for a long time and and one of the main question i will ask my guests is um is there someone out there that inspire you in your day to day work or life, uh, especially here we're talking about engineering culture. So I'm talking about someone, but you can extend that to a company uh, that you will want to hear from their engineering culture. So our job will be to go and find them and bring them here on the podcast. <laughs> and ask them the question you will have for them if 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 you are able to do so i'm i'm, I'm i will be in uh, <laughs> <laughs> people know uh, uh, that uh, some people know i'm i'm a great fan of formula 1 and that's not only because of uh, of the uh, watching the race but also to understand what's going on behind the screen so how how do they how do they enable the teams or the engineers to to bring every race a lot of new uh, yeah. stuff onto the car? Yeah. Thinking about that, if we if we could could do it like that in in, in our company, it would be great. So uh, yeah, the, 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 that's that's great to see. So if you can have some engineers out of uh, the Red Bull family or uh, Mercedes, uh, even Ferrari, I don't care. But <laughs> I can, I can actually bring I can br actually bring Lewis Hamilton himself right here, so he can. Great, I mean, <laughs> okay, fantastic. Peter Paul, any any? Uh, any? I, I think that that uh, I, I don't have a specific, but I think that it's even for for engineers good to to have keep this open mindedness and to keep this. So anyone who could tell me or uh, the audience a lot about. Uh, Psychological uh, safety and uh, openness, and giving uh, good good uh, uh, feedback, uh, like like Bree Brown does, uh, so, something in, in 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 that range of things. Yeah, that that would be be awesome, I guess, because I think that these skills um, and the communication skills and the openness and the staying open for ideas and getting this feedback that that would really help uh, people to to move forward and really get uh, things on. Besides all the technical aspects, Peter Paul, do you have anyone in mind? Because then, then, then you uh, just I mean, ask me to look at the all uh, Google and try to find a person. But maybe someone you have in mind. If you don't have that, okay. that name, right. okay, yeah, so, so, um, so, so there's um, this author Jitske Kramer who uh, wrote uh, recently a book about uh, yeah the things that we're going through now being in the pandemic and having to work from home and going into uh, 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 going into a hybrid situation and she's an anthropologist and she also needs that openness to to how culture evolves and how culture is evolving and someone like that I think would uh, especially if you look at that part would also be a really interesting uh, person to uh, to uh, ask to uh, to join you I guess okay fantastic putting the team at work and we're gonna bring those people on board, trust me. Cool. Uh, okay, everyone, uh, we have it. This is the uh, engineering po uh, culture postcard. And the point here was to actually get to know ball.com from the inside. So we brought people from there and to tell us what is happening behind that huge machine and how it's all from the inside. Peter Paul and Peter uh, have an amazing podcast and you can uh, find them. We're going to put it in, 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 on, on the podcast when we publish it. Uh, but maybe uh, Peter Paul or one of you can kind of uh, spit it out. What is it? What's the name exactly? So the tech lab, can you go ahead? Just share that with people so they know where to find it. Yeah. So in the, in the techlab.ball.com, 
uh, the podcast you will find on find on our slash podcast, uh, but also in your favorite podcast player, Spotify, Apple, or one of your own uh, favorites. But you also find the blog post on the techlab.ball.com. So uh, go there and find that. And uh, yeah, if you want to, uh, if you think of subjects that you want to hear of, you just reach out to us and uh, and we will help you out. Actually, I'm I'm really curious. You have a lot of great questions uh, left. And some of them might be interesting to discuss in a podcast. So uh, how are we dealing with those questions today? So uh, what we're going to do there, so I can already see people being like round two, round two. So maybe we can go for round two or, um, uh, yeah, we can find, I don't really have an answer right now, to be honest with you. But what I'm trying to find is basically a way to say, I'd be happy to to talk with you again and, and dive further because those are just a few questions out of thousand we can bring on. You, you're yeah. working in one of a really amazing organization. So there are more stuff we can unheard from there. So uh, maybe you have another idea, Peter, and how you will want to I think it's, it. it's good to, uh, to dive into the questions and have a chat about it, how to, uh, yeah. how to, uh, how to address uh, for them. For those yeah. people uh, uh, listening there, uh, the, uh, the other question were also going into more like, them as uh, engineers and uh, uh, how they got there and what are the challenge did they did they learn did they had to follow a training to get to that point right so there are many other things we had we we wanted to cover here but unfortunately running out of time but no worries we're gonna make sure that we we answer those questions either on another podcast or uh, via a, a blog post or actually on your podcast that is also possible. So uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Peter and Peter Paul. You were awesome. And thank you to the audience for your, your, your questions. And I'm going to make sure that the question that we didn't answer will be on the document. So hopefully next time uh, we will have time to answer them. Okay. Thank you, Thanks. people. You were awesome. Bye, Peter Paul. Bye, Peter. Thanks. Bye, it's everyone. great to be here. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.